Let, let me um, first say, uh, I'm, I'm the setup guy here. Uh, actually, Hal is the punchline. And the reason for this is that on this, as on many of the projects that Hal and I work on jointly, it's about half a dozen at the moment, uh, I wave my arms a lot, and then Hal actually makes things work. Um, one of the reasons that we're presenting Media Cloud is, to a certain extent, it doesn't work. And one of the reasons that it doesn't work is that uh, we are taking an engineering approach to some extremely deep computer science problems, by which I mean we are looking at uh, solutions that exist out there. We are linking them together uh, with the very able help of David LaRochelle, who's sitting there on the, on the corner, and sort of duct taping together existing uh, algorithms and pieces of code to try to solve a very, very difficult and deep problem. We are clearly not going to solve it based on the methodology we have at the moment. And so in part, the reason we're coming and talking to computer scientists is that there are large chunks of this problem where we need deep algorithmic help to get forward on it. But just to give you a sense for how nasty and messy the problem that we're playing with is, I've had sitting behind us uh, a paper from 1965. And, and this is a paper that in the field of media studies is pretty seminal. And I don't know to what extent it actually ends up uh, making its way into computer science departments. I'm, I'm guessing probably not nearly as much as if you were showing up at a, a good communications department. But this paper is by Johan Galtung and Mari Rouge. And it was a study um, of four Norwegian newspapers over the course of about four years, so uh, 1961 to 1965. Galftung and Rouge literally took the morning and evening newspapers uh, in Oslo and clipped out every single newspaper story that mentioned Cyprus, Congo, or Cuba. And then with an enormous stack of stories in front of them, about 1,200 that they'd accumulated over four years, they decided to try to figure out what is allowed to become news. And this is a very fundamental question. Of all the things that happen in the world on any given day, only a certain number of them end up being considered to be newsworthy. Only a certain number of them end up being amplified and get the sort of attention that you get from showing up in a newspaper. This is a question that has extremely important economic implications. It's got extremely important political implications. There are lots of stories out there of both wonderful and tragic events that essentially end up being invisible because in one fashion or another they cease to be news. There's also uh, the possibility of events that get far too much attention and far too much scrutiny by virtue of the fact that they may not be particularly newsworthy, but we're sort of addicted to them in one fashion or another. We can't stop looking at them. You can think of celebrity news. You can think of fascinations with the individual machinations of political campaigns. The question of what gets to become news is an interesting and sort of deep political one, and we think also one that you can start asking some quantitative questions about. The reason this paper was interesting is that in 1965, these two took a crack at answering this question quantitatively. And so they went through these articles and they figured out some very basic things. When you mention the leader of a country, news involving those high status individuals is far more likely to get attention uh, than ordinary people on the street. Stories that involve large, powerful nations like the United States or the Soviet Union were far more likely to get mentions uh, than simply uh, interactions between uh, Cyprus and Greece, for instance. If you had uh, the prime minister of the UK visiting, there was a much greater chance of becoming news. So based on doing extrapolation from analyzing that text, they were able to put forward 13 rules, which, while they may not actually be methodologically supported by the data, turn out to be a pretty good way of understanding how news gets shaped. And in fact, our understanding of news still owes a lot to this paper. Um, I've spent the last six or seven years sort of screwing around with this paper and trying to find different ways to ask questions about this. And I put out a paper in 2003 uh, using a brain dead stupid methodology that doesn't work very well, which basically involves going to Google News, searching for the name of a country, and saying, how many stories do you have about this Google News, and then mapping it. Anyone here who's ever done any algorithmic work can come up with 20 reasons why that shouldn't work. You're right. All 20 of them are good reasons why it doesn't work. You can still make some interesting generalizations about this. And what I was able to demonstrate roughly in that paper is that media attention in a lot of US media sources roughly tracks GDP per capita. We are far, far more likely to read news about wealthy countries than we are about poor countries. Simplest way to understand this is to look at Nigeria versus Japan. Nigeria shows up a very gentle shade of pink in this map. Japan shows up a significantly darker shade of red. The darker the red, the more intense the attention, the lighter the blue. 
uh, sorry, the darker the blue, the lighter the attention. Japan and Nigeria have roughly the same population. They're both about 130 million. They're both enormously strategically and geopolitically important. On any given day across US media, there's about an eight to 12 times ratio of news on Japan as there is to Nigeria. Now it's interesting, this actually shows up very, very differently in different media. It gets down to about two to one in British media, in part because of long involvement uh, of the British Empire within West Africa. So there are historical factors that tend to shape this, but within US media, you can make some interesting generalizations about how income works in here. If you're interested in this, you shouldn't read my stuff because it's methodologically problematic. You should read Dennis Wu, who's over at uh, Northeastern. He's done a really nice job of this on sort of newsroom and news gathering factors where he looks at where AP and Reuters and all of these other news organizations are deployed, and he's able to demonstrate a very tight correlation between where newspaper men are and how reporting happens. Yeah. I'm sure that's true. Um, yep. Absolutely. And, and so the work that I've done on this was around Google News, around the BBC, around the New York Times. So this at this point is Google News. One of the interesting things that I was able to do early on and that was look at Technorati, which at that point was a pretty good analog for what was happening in the most popular blogs. Saw a very, very similar pattern, in some ways even a more pronounced pattern. A lot of sort of cyber utopian celebration about this idea that we were gonna get a more diverse view of the world out of blogs. I'm guilty of some of that since we've been building this network of blogs from the developing world. When you look at a large set of them, you seem to have a very similar geographic focus and geographic attention. So th these are really inept ways of doing this. And I mentioned they're methodologically problematic. Where we would like to get, and what Media Cloud is sort of designed to do, is to take what we were doing here and get just beyond geography to get into questions of what the topics are. Um, who the individuals you focus on are. Can you make large generalizations about what certain types of media are paying attention to or not paying attention to? And, and what this means at a certain point is what we'd really like to have is the ability to take a media source like the New York Times and give you a nutritional information label for it. Over the past week, here's what the New York Times has focused on. Here's what the New York Times has not focused on. Here's how it compares to some of the other players in the space. Um, we would also like to be able to build this into your web browser. So we'd love to be able to voluntarily let you look at what you're looking at on the web and give you an indication that all you've looked at over the last day is recaps of the Packers 49ers game and you haven't actually found anything out about Latin America. Uh, again, voluntarily. I, I don't want to mandate this on anyone's Firefox, but it would be nice to have as a plugin that can go in there. What we really want, more than anything else, is we want a way of sort of understanding the interactions between new emerging media, existing media. Where are new ideas, new memes, new ways of framing a story coming from? I think we have a mental model of how new media works, which essentially says we have wire services out there, we've got AP and Reuters, they report, they end up in mainstream newspapers where they may add some things to it, embellish, and then bloggers comment and fact check and that becomes I don't know that that's true. Uh, actually, I don't know that that's the existing cycle. We're starting to see other cycles sort of come into play. One of the really disturbing ones that I've seen come into play is people start talking on Twitter, an emerging topic ends up making it into the right frame on Twitter, and then the newspapers report on it whether they have any facts or not. So the question is, how do we eliminate the question mark out of this and start putting some arrows and weights in there? Who's feeding whom? How does the dynamic work? How do we go back and forth on it? So, the ways people have done quantitative media analysis over the last decade or so fit into sort of three general categories. Probably the best work out there is being done by the Project for Excellence in Journalism at a site called journalism.org. They have something called the News Coverage Index, which looks at a set of 53 US media sources. That includes a couple of websites, it includes some radio stations, some newspapers, a, a real swath between large and small press. And they literally have a room full of people, about half as many people as are in this room, and they hand code the data. And what they're able to tell you on any given week is roughly what stories dominated the news hole, how much attention they got, 
Uh, they can often tell you something about the tone. It's a very, very powerful project. If you're at all interested in media attention, you need to be subscribing to their newsletter. They're doing some of the best work out there. Um, but it's, it's agonizingly difficult to do. It requires enormous amounts of money. There are commercial companies doing this as well. There's a group called Media Tenor, which you can hire to essentially do brand management for you. And they will do a combination of automated search for your company or for your issue, as well as sort of manual classification of was it a positive or was it a negative mention. They can give you a general sense of how you're being perceived. These methods are highly accurate. They're incredibly flexible. You can ask fairly subtle questions. Was the, po uh, the coverage positive or negative? Were people talking about Obama in this particular context? You can do this yourself. And in fact, we do a lot of media experiments where you just sit down and hand code 20, 50, 100 pieces of media. The problem is you get to a point where you just can't do it anymore. It's very, very difficult to get a sort of large, statistically meaningful data set. You can outsource the problem and have lots and lots of different people work on it, but then you start bumping into questions of intercoder reliability. How do you get everybody using the same classification? How do you uh, get rid of your, your error collection? One of the biggest problems for us is that this is never real time. PEJ, by investing millions of dollars a year, can tell you what's going on about it a week after the fact. And for their really big trends, they're telling you about three months after the fact. So we'd love to get to the point where we can do some of this stuff in real time. There is some gorgeous stuff being done closer to real time, not exactly in real time. And this largely is in the field of link analysis. So there was a, a great paper in uh, 2005 called Divided They Blog uh, by Adamich and Glantz, which looked at a set of sort of hand classified US political blogs and tried to get a sense for what's the left and the right in the American blogosphere talking to one another. And the way they did this is they looked at links to one another, and they looked at links to third-party sites. And what they found was a huge cluster of blue blogs linking to one another, a huge cluster of red blogs, a very, very small bit of overlap between the two. Uh, our friend and colleague Esther Hargitay went back, repeated some of this research with a slightly different data set, looked at that intersection where the left talks to the right, and the left usually says very rude things to the right and vice versa. It's not that that's sort of you know, the, the golden middle ground of democracy. That's actually the space at which we all yell at one another when we actually bother to address one another. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous piece of work uh, done by John Kelly and Bruce Etling, who's sitting in the room here, uh, looking at classifying blogospheres based on who they link to. So not how one blog links to another, but linking to third party sources. These are clusters of Iranian blogs, and what you're seeing here is the Iranian blogosphere clustering in four general topical spaces. You have a reformist group down here, which is the group that we all sort of thought we knew about in the Iranian blogs. We sort of knew there had to be a conservative group, but we didn't know very much about it. We actually were able to find out from this that there was a, a group called the Twelvers who believe in the Twelfth Imam, who have their own set. There's a group called Mixed Networks that are actually sort of hard to define and hard to say who they're all about. In the top left, there's this wonderful cluster that no one would have anticipated, which is Persian poetry, uh, which turns out to be one of the most powerful forces in the Iranian blogosphere. Uh, uh, people who are trading back and forth uh, love poetry, some of which actually gets political and occasionally gets censored. Uh, if you do this for the, the, uh, the US blogosphere, you end up with a knitter cluster, which I, I tend to think of as having a certain amount of parallels to it. You didn't think that it was there, but it actually turns out to be an enormously powerful sort of cluster that you would only get out of doing the link analysis. What's great about link analysis is you don't hand code. You sort of set out a crawler, it goes, it figures out who points to who. A link is a pretty unambiguous symbol. You can use really large data sets, you can automate it. There are good tools out there that look in terms of hubs and authorities and networks. You can throw that at your data and you can come up with some good generalizations. The problem with it is that the link is only one aspect of content. It doesn't help you at all with traditional media because newspapers for the most part don't link. Even ones that you've moved online, they don't link particularly often. It works really well for blogs, it works really poorly for mainstream media. It only looks at the structure. It doesn't look at the content of the text, which means that you're looking at a small part of what's inherent in that. There's a real danger that you somehow conflate the link structure with an underlying social structure. And I don't know that there's necessarily uh, 
evidence, although I'm hoping Bruce will jump on me if I manage to get that wrong, that these guys necessarily hang out together. One of the other challenges with it is that after you've built these clusters, you do need someone who speaks Persian or Russian or so on and so forth to come in and tell you what these clusters actually are. Because what you're able to say is that these things are related to each other in terms of graph theory, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what they're about. So we're starting to get excited about things that are doing content-based analysis. The projects that are out there are pretty primitive. There are people who are taking Google News and trying to map together the way that Google News clusters together stories to do comparative attention to stories. There's a beautiful art project that actually gives you a sense for what you might do with a huge data set called We Feel Fine, which is basically just a specialized spider that looks for people saying, I feel and then tries to figure out what people are talking about in terms of their emotions and how it differs demographically between the people who are speaking. I think probably the best rigorous work that's being done on content at this point is being done by a group at Cornell called Meme Tracker, which is looking at quotes. So phrases like, um, you can put lipstick on a pig, I, I, you can, and so um, they look at how a quote is used in full and then subdivided to try to figure out how a story moves through the media. So the theory being that when someone says a full quote, that's apparent, and then you can look for children coming down off of it, and you can watch through media diffusion. And their paper on Meme Tracker actually had a very, very interesting finding, suggesting that there's a very small subset of blogs that may actually be leading newspapers, which again goes counter to that theory that I posited, which has sort of become the mainstream belief of how blogs work together. Content analysis is just becoming possible. What's nice about it is that theoretically you should be able to work with any sort of unstructured text. If you can do it well, you should be able to do large data sets and automate it. You should be able to do pretty visualization around it. There are huge downsides. It's inaccurate. It's never going to be as accurate as hand coding this stuff, at least not in the near future. There are language constraints. All the systems we have to do this, to sort of look at a text and say, here are the entities in these texts, here are the topics in these texts, are language specific. So even if you build a lovely system for English, it's a real challenge to get it to Russian, which is in fact the challenge that we're working on right now. And now more than a year into this project, we're discovering that even if what you're doing is duct taping together components, it's an enormous, enormous programming investment. So we have put out a prototype system called Media Cloud. It's at mediacloud.org. The truth is what you see on mediacloud.org is disappointing. It's an alpha that we put out a long time ago. It actually doesn't give you a very good sense of what our system does. In a moment, we're going to hand you over to Hal, who will show you what our system does. The very basic concept behind it is that we have a spider out there. It's not a spider, I'm sorry. We are subscribing to tens of thousands of news feeds out there, RSS feeds. So we're going to newspapers, we're finding all of the RSS feeds they have, we're going to blogs, we're going to any media outlets we can find, we're subscribing to their RSS and Adams feeds. We're pulling in all those stories, we're actually getting the full stories, uh, which is pretty non-trivial because you're usually getting a snippet out of the RSS, we're going to the URL, we're stepping through the pages, retrieving all of it. We're extracting the story text out from all the cruft. So we're pulling all the formatting data, all the navigation data, and we're actually getting to the story text. We're tossing that towards uh, Open Calais from Reuters, which is a pretty good extractor system. We're also using other systems to try to get term extraction and topics out of it. And then we're dumping it into a database. And at this point, that's largely all we're doing. And the reason behind that is that while we have huge research questions, we're trying to sort of be the middleware layer. And the middleware that we're trying to be is we want to provide terabytes of data coming out of media and tools to pull this in and do some analysis on it. But neither of us are communication scholars, so we'd really rather let those communication scholars figure out how to build experiments and ask questions about this, whether they're journalists, whether they're uh, journalism critics, whether they're communication scholars. We're also building a system that has a bunch of little parts in it, some of which don't work very well at this point. And we very much want to work with the computer science community to try to figure out how to make those things work out. But for a sense of how this actually works at this point, I'm going to hand it over to someone who actually works on it. So I'm going to start off by showing you um, the end results, I hope. 
So um, what I'm going to show you first is the sort of um, the tail end of, of what we're getting out of all the work we're doing. And then I'm going to go back and step through um, how we're generating those results and all of the good and the not so good things we're doing. So uh, what we've built is what we're calling our dashboard. And the idea here is you can type in any of the news sources we're covering from the New York Times. And you can get a sense of um, the kinds of language that the New York Times is using. So this is uh, a little bit interesting. You can see uh, broadly what kinds of things they're talking about. You can read, we, this is for the week of, uh, <laughs> this is for the week of October 12th, uh, which is when the playoffs were. So you can see they're doing a lot of talking about baseball. Um, and then you can even, uh, if you're wondering about the specifics of any of these things, if you're wondering who uh, Lidge is, you can dig down in and, and you can see the specific sentences that were used to discuss that term. And how you should put it, you're running a drive on top of that. Yeah, so this is a development system which is running off of my little USB drive here. <laughs> uh, so there might be waits of a few seconds or something. So this gives us a sense of Lidge is, um, is uh, actually don't even know who he is. He's a manager. Place for the Phillies. Please. Place, okay. <laughs> and then this links off to the stories too, so you can look at the actual stories. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of how that's helpful in a sense. In a large sense, what we're trying to do with this dashboard system is, is trying one method of going from all this sort of raw data that Ethan described we're collecting to trying to be able to m help people make some sort of conclusions about the substance of what's in these stories. So we can do this not only with, uh, with individual sources, but we can also do it with sets of sources. So we can take the a list of the top 10 US mainstream media and we can get the same sort of thing. We can get a sense of what they're talking about as well. It looks pretty similar to the New York Times. Um, and then this over here is just a trend line to see sort of over time, over, the la over that week, what they were talking about and how it differed. Uh, and then the other thing we can do is we can throw, we have all these lists of words. We can throw this into a clustering system. Um, and what this is basically telling us is uh, how do these sources group together according to the kinds of words that they use in their stories. Uh, and what we get here is we get a couple of sort of uh, pretty hard journalism sources. Uh, and then we get two um, clusters, which are mainly uh, the local newspapers who write a lot about sports and the non-local newspapers who don't write much about sports. Um, we can also do this for the new media. Uh, and this is going to take a second to load. This is a list, uh, this is a list of 1,000 blogs. One of the challenges we have is just figuring out which media we want to track and how to make sense of them. I'll talk in a little bit about what it means. One of the questions is what are the top 10 US mainstream media? Uh, what we've used for this list is uh, some data from Google about which of these sites are getting the most traffic. Uh, but it's always a difficult question just to identify those lists. Uh, for this popular blogs list, what we're using is a list from blog lines. Blog lines has a list of their top 1,000 feeds. Uh, so it's not at all perfect, uh, but it's one um, pretty good snapshot of, of, uh, of um, the most popular blogs in the US at least. Um, and so this is where it starts to get pretty interesting. You see that this uh, set of words look really quite different than the mainstream media. You have some of the same political stuff like American and Obama, but then you also have um, a lot of tech stuff. You have this Google and internet and software and Microsoft stuff. Um, and Twitter, and then you have uh, all, all blogs talk a lot about what they love, so love always comes up a lot. Um, and then you have, uh, um, and then you, the photo stuff is always, you always have big clusters of photo stuff. And then if we cluster this, here's where we start to get some really pretty interesting results. The first thing you find is that the US popular blogs list actually contains about um, 12 Spanish language blogs. <laughs> so that's just a good test case that your clustering is uh, working at a base level. Um, and then we start to get some interesting blogs. You have this sort of Google, Google cluster, which is a cluster of people talking mostly substantively about Google. And you can um, just sort of dig into this stuff and get a sense of, for instance, how Google Sightseeing is talking about Google. Um, you, can go, you, can, you can go to the page for a specific source. I picked this at random, which I shouldn't have done. The reason this has a crappy little cloud here is it probably only had one story for the week, so it didn't have much. Um, it didn't have much to work on. If we go to like TechCrunch, that'll give us more interesting results. And then again, we can sort of dig into individual sources so we can get a sense of how this is, in what sense is this covering Google? In what sense is this about Google? Is this an artifact or is it real? 
TechCrunch obviously seems pretty real. They're talking about Google a lot. Um, and then, but and then we see this sort of expected political uh, cluster here. Lots of people talking about Obama. One interesting thing here is that when you're looking at the um, when you're looking at the actual content at this level, you end up with all of the sort of right and the left stuff together because they're all using broadly the same kinds of language. Uh, and it's not, at least at this level, clustering with all this other stuff. It doesn't pop, the right versus left distinctions pop, don't pop out so much. What pops out is the political versus non-political. And then, very interestingly, we get um, two clusters here, one for quilting and one for knitting. So who'd have known, right, that of the top 1,000 blogs, 50-some-odd um, of those blogs are about quilting and knitting. And if you dig through to these, you, they seem all to be really about um, knitting and quilting. And if you add those together, you get about as many blogs. Oh, <laughs> good thing. Um, if you you have about as many of those blogs in the Nilting and Quilting group as you have in the Obama group in the politics group. So all of a sudden, so we're already starting to get pretty interesting results about what the sort of composition of these of these groups are. We also have um, we also have a list of of the long tail blogs, and that is just a random sample of a thousand blogs of roughly all of the blogs in the U.S. that we, we got from uh, the Spinner API. Spinner is a, a company that um, tracks blogs. Uh, and another thing that we can do is we can, um, we can compare the uh, sets of sources to one another. So after my, um, my pitiful laptop sinks for a minute, what's going to come up here is a set of comparative word clouds where on one hand we have the set, sets of words that are more likely to appear in the popular blogs than the uh, random long tail blogs. And on the other side, we're going to have the kinds of words that tend to appear more in the long tail blogs than the popular blogs. Um, so on the, on the left, you see something that looks pretty similar to, to what we saw for the raw feed, except you see the technology stuff really pops out a lot more. So that means there's a lot of representation of technology in the popular blogs, but not as much if you go out into the long tail. And then you have this really interesting list in, in the, on the long tail side. They talk about God a lot. They talk about education, teachers, teaching, and students a lot. Uh, they talk about love a lot. Again, they have a law list, which is uh, um, law is uh, comedy stuff. Uh, you have this that pops out that's on another list. So, um, so this, again, is giving us a pretty good snapshot of, of by it's going from this sort of raw list of text and words we have to actually making some interesting conclusions about how the content of these sets of sources uh, differ from one another. So those are those are the sort of results that we're getting now. I'm going to just move through really pretty quickly uh, because we're taking up a lot of time. But I'm going to move pretty quickly through each of the components and sort of what we're doing at each stage and what's working and what's not working. And I hope that you'll sort of pepper me with questions, criticism, suggestions uh, afterwards. So there are a number of, of challenges here. One is that there's lots of media in the world. And we are a sort of medium scale system. So we're a, a sort of order of magnitude above what you can do with hand coding. But we're never, as a project of, of a research center at Harvard, we're never going to be of the sort of Google News size or the, where we're tracking you know, millions of sources. We're always going to be in those sort of tens of thousands of sources um, uh, size, most likely. So that means we have to make choices about what we're going to cover. Uh, and, and a lot of those, it turns out it's very hard to make choices, for instance, about what is, what is the set of 1,000 or even 10,000 blogs that are going to represent all blogs in the world, or what, are the thousand, what is the set, what, do you, what set of media do you choose to represent mainstream media? Um, even when you have those list of sources, it's non-trivial, especially for the mainstream media, to just um, collect the feeds from the sources. So one of the main things that makes this project possible is that all these sources publish RSS feeds. So it's very easy for us to get the li what list of stories are published in general once you have the RSS feed. But it turns out for virtually all mainstream media, there's no feed for all the stories from that source. So there's no New York Times RSS feed. There are 200 some odd New York Times RSS feeds. So there's some challenge in just going out and figuring and writing some code to go out and capture what those 200 feeds are. And then there are substantive hard, there are additional hard questions about what constitutes the New York Times. Does free com is free economics part of the New York Times? Or is it just a separate blog? And those are questions we just have to address, address and struggle with. Um, the other part of our system, which is pretty, probably the most straightforward part, is just our crawler. Our crawler just goes out and gets 
the RSS feeds from each of these um, feeds uh, every few hours and then just downloads all the URLs it finds. The one little bit of extra work it does is it tries to do paging. So if there's a little next page link at the bottom of the story, it tries to get the subsequent pages as well so that you don't just get the first page in the New York Times story, you get all 10 pages. Um, the next thing we do is once we have all that content, um, when you have a New York Times story, you end up with not just the story, but you end up with a lot of cruft around it, what we think of cruft as far as navigation and ads and other stuff that's not the text of the story itself. Um, ideally, that would be in the RSS feed, and for, some, for most blogs it is, but for virtually all mainstream media, all you get for the, in the RSS feed is maybe a sentence or two of a description of the text. So we have to, we have to somehow figure out how to strip all, out all those ads, and especially in the navigation, from the text of the story, because otherwise, um, you'll think that every that two thirds of all New York Times stories for the next four years are about Obama, just because almost every page includes a link to Obama. So we so we have a system that does this extraction. So uh, if we take um, this is an example of a story that we've downloaded about uh, Iraq and oil investment, and what we've done is we've taken if we look at the actual story, uh, it looks like this. So you can see it's got all this cruft around it. This is what we downloaded. And we ran it through our extractor and we ended up with this. So we ended up with a big block of text. Um, and the way that we do this is we have a number of different signals. The core signal we use is the, um, the HTML density of each line. And what that basically means is uh, for a sentence like this over here, um, which is the link which we don't want, there's going to be a lot of HTML around that to format it and make it a link and not very much text on that line. But for a line like this, um, there's going to be lots of text and not very much formatting. So as a very broad signal, that does a pretty good job of telling us what is the substantive text and what's not. But it doesn't do a good enough job, so we end up having to add a bunch of other um, uh, modifiers in there. Uh, we can actually go to uh, one of these stories, and you can see this tells, this is our little extractor page that tells us what the system is doing for each line. So these purple lines here are, are ones that we're extracting. Um, the, this, the score right here is the raw HTML density, and then the score here is the modified density with all of our other modifiers added. So ex an example is some of the modifiers, very long lines in absolute terms are, are more likely to be uh, substantive text. Lines um, that are far away from a previous line, so the further away you get from something that looks like text, the less likely you are to be real text. And then we do, um, the final thing we do is we do a, a similarity test. We just look at how similar is this text to the text that we do get in the, for the title and the description of the RSS feed. And if it looks very similar to that text, then we'll, we'll have a discount on it. So this is an example of a line that looked like maybe it was not substantive text because if you look at the text of the line over here, you see it's got some links in it. Um, so it's got a fair amount of HTML. But once we did all of the, all of the functioning on it, we, we uh, scored it correctly. This is also our training system. So these checkboxes over here say um, whether or not it should be included as substantive text. So what we do is we design this algorithm in a generic sense, and we have a set of, of about a thousand stories that we've just manually gone through and trained like this. And then every time we make modifications, we just rerun against the train set and we see what, how accurate it is. Um, the biggest problem with this system now is it's, we're, we capture almost all of the text we're supposed to capture. Uh, the problem is including text that we shouldn't be including. There's a lot of edge cases of text that looks like some substantive text that is not really. So that's been our challenge going forward. Um, after we get all of this text, we just have a generic tagging system. Um, <coughs> so we so we can just send the send the text into any sort of tagging any set of tagging modules, and it comes back with a list of tags. So one of those tagging modules is Calais. So all we did was we just uh, connected to the Calais web service and sent it this text and it sent us back a bunch of um, tags that it thinks the story is about. So it thinks it's about New York and, and the Islamic Republic of Iran and electricity. Um, and then uh, we can also send it through other tagging modules if we want. We have another module called our New York Times Topics which is a module which is just a simple, simple dictionary matcher which just means we take the list of, the New York Times publishes a list of topics that it, it's about um, three or 4,000 news topics that it thinks are interesting to the world at any given point. And we just try to find those words in the text of the story. 
Um, you see it ends up being a, a higher quality but much smaller list. And it especially is not, um, it's much better for coverage of domestic news than international news, which again you see here it doesn't have that. Um, Yahoo has a similar service to Calais. You just um, shove some text in and it gives you some tags, but uh, in our testing it's not as good. It includes more just nonsense stuff, like Vigilant Guardian. Um, and then uh, the, other th the other thing that we do that we're actually using more for the analysis that we're doing right now is we create vectors from all this stuff, which is just means for every story that we download, we just um, break it up into the individual words and have a list of how many of each word appears in each story. And that's important because there's a great deal of natural language processing work that's based on just having those list of words that appear in each story. That's, for instance, how we do the clustering that we do is based on those list of stories. Um, and then the final part is the clustering stuff, which is a great example of us just using, plugging in stuff that's already there. We use a toolkit called Pluto that's, one, that's a very good toolkit that has lots of knobs and switches of um, half different way, different algorithms to run the clustering on and different um, uh, metrics to judge the similarity by. So we basically just plug into this Pluto system. We can create any, we can just do any clustering run by giving a set of stories and a start date and end date and we run it. And part of the nature of clustering um, is always that it's incremental. You just twist knobs basically until you get results that look good. <laughs> it's always a sort of secret of this stuff. Um, so this, this lets us sort of, you can see I've, I've just spent a lot of time um, iterating over these lists of clusters to try to get clusters that seem to make sense. One example of the, of the limitations is the toolkit that we're using, you have to tell it how many clusters you want. So you have to tell you want 10 clusters or 5 clusters or 3 clusters. So that's a moderate matter. Again, you just run it and um, it sometimes seems like it's got stuff mixed up or it sometimes seems like it's splitting stuff arbitrarily. And that's just something you have to um, keep in mind. I just want to jump in and, and just talk for maybe two or three minutes about what this might mean for people who are sort of using this for media research or, or political science research. And, and this is just a really early experiment we did with some colleagues over at uh, George Washington University. They were asked by uh, colleagues at the, uh, the U.S. Institute for Peace what we could do as far as analyzing media to understand media coverage in conflict environments. And so what we did is we took a, a fairly narrow data set. We took a month's worth of data. We looked at seven newspapers, 17 political blocks, so a very, very small subset of what we have. And this is just because we wanted to focus on how we transformed and visualized the data. We could easily scale this up and look at a much, much larger set. The goal was to look at uh, three specific conflicts that were taking place during that period of time, two which were sort of real conflicts and one which you can think of as a stalled conflict, which is the ongoing action in Darfur. So this is a set that included the Iran election protests, it included the end of the Sri Lankan war, and uh, we were also looking at Darfur at the same time. We started looking at this and one of the things that we realized was that just to, to get a comparison for what was going on. So first of all, in this set, uh, the two lines that you can actually see distinctions in are the Iran coverage. Everything else simply flattens out, and it's just uh, orders of magnitude smaller. Uh, even despite the fact that a 30-year-long civil war uh, ended, you simply can't see it within the data. This becomes even more apparent when you bring in another story that was going on at the same time, which is Michael Jackson's death. And uh, the paper that we really want to get out of this in the long run is uh, we think we have definitive proof uh, that Michael Jackson ended the Iranian Revolution. Uh, we, we think this might, in fact, be a major revolutionary. In fact, I would go further and suggest that I would look for Ahmadinejad as having blame for the death of Michael Jackson because it does appear to be what killed off the, uh, the Iran elections protest story. Uh, I, again, all other stories sort of in comparison to the size of these stories uh, end up paling in comparison. Um, it's interesting. We had expected uh, to see with Iran uh, a little bit of blogs leading mainstream media uh, because particularly uh, we saw a huge amount of information being picked up in Twitter, also picked up in blogs. It was very, very difficult for newspapers to report from the ground in Tehran. We expected to see maybe a little bit more of a leading effect than we did. Uh, but we do see a little of it with that blue line being blog attention compared to uh, the pink line being newspaper attention. It looks like you can make a case that blogs were a little bit ahead of the story in terms of their intensity of it, 
followed by newspapers holding on to it perhaps a little bit longer as bloggers fell down. This is normalized. There's, there's problems with the data, but this is sort of giving you a sense for where we might want to go with this. Um, we're also able to drill down, again, using these graphing techniques, using similarities between words, try to figure out um, specifically how people are framing within the set. And what's interesting is when we use these tools to sort of look at what words were used uh, in a particular set of stories, you realize one of the interesting limitations of our tools, we're basically amplifying noise. So we're putting a microphone at specifically stories that mentioned Iran, then we're looking at words that were more common in blogs than they were in newspapers. And what we get out of that are some things that are interesting and some things that are not. It turns out that neocon and grandstanding uh, turn out to be noise. Our parser isn't working. The phrase, uh, those grandstanding neocons, appears 40 times in our set. We should simply be tracking every sentence and only allowing one appearance of it. But we've sort of amplified that noise. Other parts are interesting. Charles Krauthammer turns out to be pretty fascinating. You drill down on him and you find out that a comment that he's made gets mentioned and analyzed in six different blogs. It only makes one newspaper. So it's an interesting way to watch how the frame is changing between the two. With Sri Lanka, we actually got a pretty novel result. We expected that what we would see is that real responsible, that's in quotes, newspapers would cover Sri Lanka. Bloggers would ignore it. Actually, what happened was when peace was declared by the government, whether it is in fact peace or not, there was a, a pretty uh, concomitant spike in both of them. What's interesting is that the newspapers came and did sort of an analysis story two weeks later saying, OK, so what now? What's the future of Sri Lanka? We didn't see that picked up at all in the blogs. So we see sort of a secondary peak, which drilling down into it appears to be about what are the long-term implications of this? How did this change? We don't end up seeing it within the blog data. The Darfur thing made me really happy. My, my thesis on Darfur was that we would find that bloggers were talking about it, but it wasn't actually showing up in the newspaper because nothing actually happened in Darfur during the period of time that we're talking about. What's interesting is that Darfur now has entered the language as a metaphor. And so drilling down, if you look in how Darfur gets mentioned, it's simply mentioned in the context of genocide in general, Congo, refugees, displacement, it's simply invoked. So it's no longer a news story specifically about defer. It's a way to sort of bring it out as an analogy. So look, this is a, a very superficial paper. It's a small amount of data. But looking at that question of how media might work differently in conflict environments, this gives you a sense for what you might be able to drill down, both in terms of general incidents and also being able to do the differences in the language. We have a tradition of ending media cloud talks by telling you what's broken. And we started making this slide together over breakfast. And uh, you know, we started with everything. And then we started subdividing out of there. Um, this turns out to be a hard problem on about half a dozen different levels. On the technical side of it, extracting, really difficult. Uh, getting clean text out of formatted HTML turns out to be almost impossible. We're probably going to need to go to a sentence by sentence model so that we don't end up with repeated sentences all the time because newspapers tend to repeat the same headline over and over and if you can't get it correctly out of your extractor, it screws up your data. Clustering is really tough. Uh, the algorithms exist. They work. You can tweak them. Um, but you know they have certain fundamental limitations. If you're clustering into 10 categories and an 11th topic comes up, you got to restart your clustering system, at least with the ones that we've been using. The big stuff we'd love to do, we want to be looking at things like meme discovery. And that example with Krauthammer is actually a pretty interesting piece of meme discovery. We were able to find that bloggers were talking about Krauthammer in a way that newspapers weren't. You could imagine following the word Krauthammer in an Iran context over a period of time and looking to see whether it got amplified or not, whether other media picked it up. We actually think we're starting to have a system where you can look for people reframing an issue. We often see in this data set a blogger saying, if you want to understand, you have to understand the story of X. And then you look for X over time. And sometimes X will get picked up by another blogger or by a newspaper. 99 times out of 100, X just disappears into the ether. And what you're watching there is a meme die before your eyes, which is sort of exciting. 
Um, but trying to figure out how to do that in a way that's not manual, where you can actually go through it and look at the whole ecosystem. Uh, I was joking with Harry before that what we really want help on is getting from that list of tags that we're generating out of these automated tools into some sort of a hierarchy. How can we then say, okay, here are the 40 specific tags, but also here's oil, which is probably the best way to sum this up, which means if you want to do that media nutritional data that we talked about at the beginning, you can say 20% of your stories were about oil, or at least mentioned oil. There's also the non-technical sides of this that get incredibly difficult. We've been able to get as far as we have, uh, not just because we have completely brilliant engineers working on this, but brilliant engineers who speak English. And it turns out that if we're going to rebuild this system for Russian, for Arabic, for Chinese, we need a great deal of linguistic data. And we really need to be working with programmers who speak those languages, because there are a thousand knobs that need to be tweaked and twiddled to get there. There are enormous, massive legal concerns associated with this. We are functionally making copies of you know, a thousand newspapers every day. And at some point, someone's going to wake up and decide that this might have some copyright issues. We really wanted, when we did this, to release all of our data. And we've been advised by our lawyers that that is probably not a good idea. So we're now moving towards an API plan where we essentially say, come use our data. We're going to monitor what you're doing with the API. If you're republishing the New York Times with your own ads on it, we will cut you off. But we'd love to let you do it for other reasons. The other one that I'll just mention in closing, and then really we will shut up and, and let you ask some questions, is dark matter. We can track stuff that we can spider and scrape and subscribe to. We can't track Facebook. We can't track links that are forwarded from one person to another via email. These turn out to be, we think, incredibly important vectors in understanding the media ecosystem. So we've got a good start. We have tons of problems to work on. We would welcome your help on it. And that's where we're at. Web Ecology is affiliated with Berkeley. Uh, it is a set of um, researchers, some of them in Cambridge, uh, some of them have Harvard affiliations, some of them are just fascinating young researchers working on things. They are very much also interested in these questions of what can quantitative data tell us about what's going on. They put out a really nice paper on Iran and Twitter. Uh, from what I understand, they're now working on a question that sounds frivolous and isn't, which is why did people turn their Twitter icons green and when did they stop? Uh, and it's a really interesting question about social action instead of distributed social action. So they are uh, beloved fellow travelers. Mm -hmm. And is there any sort of formal relationship to some of their um, the word formal and the word Berkman tend to go very poorly <laughs> together. Uh, uh, we, we know them, uh, we hang out with them, we like them. But is, what are the differences between them and them? Uh, they don't have a system. They are grabbing data sets and then are analyzing them. So for instance, they actually use some code that I've written to spider Twitter. Uh, Twitter is something we'd love to have in the system in the long run. Uh, one of the things that I should say is that we made a, a we made a point of trying to deal with open data within the system. One of the things that we really worry about is replicability of research. So we've released all the code under a federal license. You can go rebuild what we're doing by putting the code up and then rebuilding the database. But we also understand that that's bullshit because it takes you a year to build the database that we have, and it's an enormous amount of computational resources. So that's why we're not trying to open the data. For yeah. Because of that design decision, we've also tried to steer away from collections of data where people have come and said, oh, you're Harvard. We'd love to work with you. Let's give you some data. Twitter is one of those cases. You can get all of Twitter's stream data if you either pay them or if you beg them. Um, we've stayed away from that uh, because if someone else is going to replicate our work, they may not be able to pay or they may not be able to beg. Twitter actually just announced its first meaningful revenues, $4 billion, from selling information about their system, which includes access to all of their feeds. So given that that now appears to be part of the business model, for now, we're probably going to stay at, at arm's length 
Uh, but yeah, they use some of my scripts, they've now refined them, they're collecting tweets on specific tags, and then they're doing analysis with certainly shared ideas back and forth. We'd love to get to the point where a media cloud system could be including Twitter as well. What's tricky about it is that 140 characters doing things like clustering and doing textual analysis get pretty tricky. Can I ask you a question about the, the, uh, the your relationship with the, with the, the newspapers that you're, I mean, you mentioned the potential media conservatives. Uh, do, they, do they consider you to be their friends, or do you, do, do they, uh, do you think you've discovered anything about them that they don't know about themselves already, or? So, what's been interesting is figuring out who's interested in this system. Um, people who study journalism, so folks like Columbia Journalism Review, get fascinated by this, because it's a way to get from anecdote to data and have a very different analysis on it. There are some news sites who are fascinated by this. Uh, we've had a lot of very productive conversations with Public Radio International. It happens that their president is also a totally data-driven geek, and she loves the idea of being able to monitor their coverage, compare it to other networks out there, get a sense for what they're strong at and what they're weak at. One of the many missteps of this project is that we launched it at the same time as American journalism was collapsing. So trying to get people interested in what they're covering better or worse doesn't work real well when everyone's response is, we can't do anything anymore, the sky is falling. And so it's been very, very difficult to get people to sort of pay attention to this. What people do want to do is ask questions about how journalism is changing and does this cause change. So for instance, a colleague at USC Annenberg said, could we use Media Cloud to study what happens when journalists start paying attention to how many people look at a story? That's a great question. So all these newsrooms are now sort of refocusing on this question of how much web traffic are you generating? Does that change how you write? Does that change your topical coverage? If someone's got that in newsroom data, we should be able to have that outside data and we should be able to form it to Another thing that this potentially lets us do is to answer the question of what happens when the Boston Globe disappears, right? If you sort of generate, this is one of, a broad way of, of um, describing what we can do with these sort of comparative um, media source analyses is to be able to say what does the what does the Boston Globe add to the world, right? And the converse of that is true, which is if the Boston Globe goes away, what do we do? The okay. truth is for, for some of us, but we really want to start. And one of the things that we're considering doing is the New York Times has actually been very friendly about this and said, do you want to run this on our archives? Our open data side of this makes us say no, because their archives aren't as open as we'd like to be. The researchers in us sort of go, well, hell yeah. I mean, one of the questions that everyone would like really good data on, everyone I hang out with would like really good data on, is what's the percentage of international to domestic to local coverage over time? We know through Paul Starr's work that you know, in the early 1800s, we were running at you know, 8 to 20 international to domestic. We know that it's you know, shifted probably to 28 in the other direction. Did that happen all at once? How's that happen gradually? If we could throw that at the New York Times from 1851 to the present, that we'd have to write huge amounts of stuff to figure out that you know, Prussia uh, was not the U.S. and then sort of whole sorts of rule sets for different moments of time, and that's the sort of analysis you can imagine. For that. I, I, guess my, I guess my question really was, what, you know, why doesn't the Boston Globe want to know what the Boston Globe adds to the world? I mean, would, would, don't they have a commercial interest in understanding themselves in the way that you were making them make it possible to understand? Or, or do you think that they? That's what that's what I'd say. You know, they, 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 you say the uh, you know our coverage, your coverage is in proportion. To uh, national, you know, your coverage of, of, of foreign countries is, is in proportion to, you know, uh, uh, per capita GDP. And they say, yeah, we do that. That's like, of course, that's the only way we get people to read our stuff. You know, I, I mean, I, you know, do they know it already? Can they use Can they use what they they have? Perhaps not for ends that you would uh, that you would want, but uh, so I, I I've been sort of in the business of confronting journalists about shortcomings that come out of their problems be of data since 2000. And what ends up happening is you sit down with journalists and you say, you know, it's funny, you guys don't write very much about the developing world. And they say, 
Yeah, I know. You know, my last 10 stories on Molly all got spiked, right? Uh, so it's not my fault, and it's not even my editor's fault. It's my publisher's fault. And the publisher, if you then talk to them, and you're lucky to have a conversation, will say, well, it's your fault, actually. You guys are the audience, and the reinforcement that we're getting is that you want hyper-local news, you want your kid's name in the paper for the Little League game, you don't give a crap about what's going on in Equatorial Guinea. And every time we run a story on Equatorial Guinea, our circulation goes down. So you know, don't tell us that we're screwing up, we're giving you what you want. Now, something in that cycle is probably dysfunctional. It doesn't make a ton of sense that in an increasingly globalized and interconnected economy, that our access to media gets more and more and more hyper local. You know, it would make sense after petroleum crashes and none of us stray more than 10 miles away from home. But at this particular moment in time, it seems like something about that reinforcement cycle isn't working well. Right. I'm hoping we can help answer some of those questions, but those are, you know, those are Galton and Rouge sized questions. Uh, you know, we're uh, 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 chipping little pieces off of it. The best. Once the journalist gets your data, would it affect how the writers are the right and not necessarily in ways that it is wrong? If I thought the journalists were actually paying attention to my data, I would be more worried but the about it. But it's not So some of this is not hard to generate internally. Uh, so I actually have a suspicion. I've been looking at the New York Times for about six years now. One of the fascinating things about the New York Times is that you can pick any country, no matter how small, and in any given calendar year, they'll run a minimum of one story. So you sort of want to be able to make that sweeping you know, question and say, you've never written about Cameroon. And the answer is, once a year, there's something on Cameroon. And it's never like, here's the annual feature on Cameroon. It just sort of comes around within. So I actually think they probably are at the times where they have really smart data analytics people looking at things like that. Is it a possibility? Absolutely. Any time you do surveillance or surveillance and you can have some sort of analysis of what your patterns are, you can have changes come out of it. But the way that I look at this, I mean, we, the reason that slide is up there as far as nutritional information is that I think in general, you want to have more information rather than less information about what's in this. If what's happened to the New York Times over the past 10 years is that it's become more and more and more a local paper. And this was certainly one of the forces in the New York Times newsroom was trying to make it more competitive with the Post and the Daily News. Well, that's an interesting thing. Is it still the paper of record? It's still this international newspaper that we think it is, if it's actually shifting. I'd rather have that data out there. Is it going to have second order effects? Sure, absolutely. But I'm um, willing, willing to take this on and would be happy if we were successful enough that we actually had measurable second order effects. But I actually have not much of a natural language processing, but are, are there, as you look at the tools for extracting terms, are there, are there tools out there that go beyond um, treating you know, uh, documents with other words and other terms and um, to what extent do <coughs> they seem suitable or not suitable for um, No. And that's one of the reasons we don't go to the job with that. There are, there are expensive tools to do that. There are hard to use tools to do that. There's a lot of computer science research. There's a lot of papers that do But in, as, far as, as far as we have found, there are no of the sort of easily duct capable tools of the kind uh, that we've used, like, for instance, the sort of clustering stuff. I mean, there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of natural language processing stuff out there. The big hard in the cross because they don't as far. I mean, we would love to see them as a goal, see what they are, but it, it make it easy to go from um, from the sort of bag of words to uh, topics, and that's been our biggest challenge and the stuff that we haven't really figured out how to do. Uh, the stuff that we've done well, um, the degree we've done it well, does a pretty good job of sort of looking at language. Thank you.
take some arbitrary set of stories and say, here are the 12, um, here are the 12 topics, or here are the 12 means that are in this set of stories. Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of that is going on in computational analysis. And in fact, I think that work we do a lot of that based on computational analysis. This is not to say there's not work being done. Again, our model is uh, we're engineers, we, and we yeah. have less than a full time programmer's time to, yeah. to work on this. So the work that we can accomplish is mostly to plug in sort of big pieces that do a lot of the work it's for us. It's not a library, and it's not open source. It's not open source. So, um, so there's lots of systems. Say it if it's not available as a library, okay. and it's not open source, at, at this point, we're not mm -hmm. interested. Um, part of the reason for this, just so you understand, is that people have been selling document clustering and topic extraction systems for six and seven figures for like years. Yeah. Back when I was in industry, we bought some of these things. Yeah. Uh, they weren't any better than the open source ones, uh, which was to say they weren't very good. Only at that point we were down six or seven figures at the time, yeah, which right. was fine because this was dot com one and this wasn't a problem. <laughs> it, is a problem. <laughs> it is a problem. <laughs> For us, and, and so what's really interesting about this from, from our perspective, just in terms of learning from failure, um, we thought, the reason we started this project was that we realized that between RSS, so that we didn't have to spy our stuff anymore, and Calais, where we could just take text, feed it to someone, they would come back with topics. We felt like for the first time we could take my geographic work, but even more than that, we could do topic work, and we could give you that nutritional information very quickly. Turns out we've actually had very little progress on that front. It's actually very, very hard to go from what Calais kicks out, which is too much. Um, Calais also, despite the fact that it's free and relatively open and there's a lot of good things about it, under the load that we've been putting it through it tends to mash words together and create new portmanteaus, and that doesn't work either. They haven't yet released weights on terms, which will be a big help for us once they do, because then we can pick the heavily weighted terms. We've actually been much more effective in doing word vectors. And so almost all your students is all about linguistics analysis. How do the average bloggers talk as compared to the elite bloggers as compared to the mainstream media? Because we've been able to do more with word vectors. In part, that's where the libraries are, and that's where we've been able to put it. So what under issue is the deep like, like all of the tagging that we're doing is empathy extraction. So that means it's, it's the easiest kind of tagging I mean, that easiest kind of natural language processing is getting people places and organizations places where you don't get as ideas or subjects. So you can get that there are a lot of stories about Bernanke, but you don't, you don't get that there are any stories about the financial crisis except for the degree you can deduce that from the type of um, And it turns out it's pretty, we found it difficult to take that collection of entities, even if it's pretty good, which like that was not as pretty good. It's hard to go, it's harder than we anticipated to go to that from that to these sort of subsequent conclusions. The country stuff is different because there's a sort of obvious question and answer that you're getting there. It's much harder to figure out what those questions and answers are for um, how many stories were about that. Stuart, do you know any any open source uh, semantic analyzes that do OBL? So this, this particular area you're talking about, which is this uh, topic clustering, is extremely hot area. So a lot of people doing different things, but it's probably not at the stage where it's packaged up into a nice little library that you just run. It's a, it's a, it's a very fast moving target. And so, I mean, and I should say what? The kind of people who, who do it tend to give their code. So there are, for instance, there are yeah. chunks of code to do this thing. I'm not mm -hmm. sure they're packaged up in you know, yeah. a beautiful source for you, yeah. you know, a library. But this is sort of the conversation that we're looking forward to have, right? Because Again, since we're, we're approaching this as duct tape engineers, looking at something that's still in the research paper phase that may be solving our problem six or five months down the line is the sort of thing that we need to know about and that we're never going to know about. So I can give you an idea of some of the things people think about. So, um, uh, if, you treat, if you treat a, a document as a bag of words, and then you can say, well, divide these bags of words into ten and those would be the top. Um, and then you raise the issue of where do you get the number 10? If, if the number is wrong, if there's really eight, then that can screw everything up. 
and you'll get a bunch of topics that are just in one. So it is really well in each single topic. So one of the areas people are working on now is trying to do this in a kind of uh, non-parametric way, where you don't say divided up into net. You say divided up into topics, and you give a prior on the distribution of the number of comments and then figure out a spread of the topics. Or you take advantage of the fact that uh, I take advantage of it. you relax the assumption that every document is about one topic, which is probably not a good assumption. So you say, well, um, you'll, you know, you'll, you ask the question, what if, what if you say there's a bunch of topics and documents are generated by first selecting a subset of topics and then selecting words based on those topics. And you can get much tighter um, topics that way because you don't have to assume that the document is exactly corresponding to the topic. So things like that. And, you know, these are the kinds of things people are working on. You might expect to get better results, but it's not like the Calais where it's we just use an API and can do it. Well, one, I mean, one of the reasons we're developing this as a, as a platform is the hope that eventually it's to the point where the people working on those kinds of problems don't want to be worrying about how to text and how to, how to shove it into their system and use the results they get. Or one, of the, one of our dreams for this is to be able to provide this as a platform and say, Here, look, here's a place where you can just plug in your really interesting code, they can do a much better job than what we're doing, which is valuable to the degree that it allows experimentation, and sometimes might give us a strong credit, strong Okay, one last question. My form of request. Um, in the dark now, you probably already heard this yourself, but I'd love to see you uh, add things like video and audio, and what would look different in the way things get recorded from the people who are working newspapers and I would like to show you something different from the visual aspect versus the audio aspect. Absolutely. Once we, once we start getting into video and audio, we're dealing with whole other classes of problems mm -hmm. that we're totally unqualified to deal with. Basically, we, we, stop this before. We, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> we start with the assumption that not only do we have text, but we've got, you know, digitized text. Right. So, um, we're already excluding things from this that don't have RSS feeds, because spidering it yourself is really painful. Um, we're sort of betting on this idea that as more and more people are transcribing, we can get better data coming out of them. The, the truth is what we're mostly doing is sort of comparative data. So uh, Elisa Miller, who is both the head of PRI, and actually one of the better scholars in this field, yeah. is doing work on television attention because her sort of bugaboo is how little international media attention there is within television newscasts. So she does handcuff. I mean, she hires some folks, they sit in a room, they go through a week's worth of evening television, she produces a data set, they put up a card ground, and they're really ugly and scary. Um, so it's still gonna be sort of point sampling on that until someone gets a really good algorithm that can listen to the radio or listen to the audio and the video being the transcript from that. As far as I understand, we're still pretty far from that discussion. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that'll, that'll get us closer. I suppose as we start getting automatic transcription coming out of it. Now, the trick with automatic transcription is going to be what the quality of that is. And it's going to be pretty low to start with. Uh, certainly anything else that we want. Okay, I think we're, the appointed hour is, uh, is, is, is here. Um, Everybody wants to chat over a little bit. Welcome to come up to the front. And I, and I believe they're looking for people to give them ideas, right? Help, help ideas, ideas, questions, code. Please help questions, help. code. Anybody <laughs> wants to give them code? <laughs> code, 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 code. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the code does. Okay, thanks so much. It was a great time.